Hello everybody and welcome back on my channel. In this episode, I'm comparing two Fujifilm telephoto lenses for wildlife photographers, the 2016 100-400mm and the new 150-600mm that was announced in 2022. We're going to talk about ergonomics, ease of use, optical quality, teleconverters and more. Let's get started. Here we have our two lenses, the 150-600mm in silver finish and the 100-400mm in glossy black finish. And the first thing you can notice is that the 100 is smaller. However, it doesn't have an internal zoom mechanism, which means it extends when increasing the focal length. Meanwhile, the 150-600 has an internal zoom, so its size doesn't change. With these photos, you can see how the two lenses compare when the 100-400mm is fully extended, as well as when the lens hoods are attached. Both lenses offer weather sealing protection and the outside is made of high-grade plastic to save some weight. On the inside, the 150-600 has a magnesium alloy frame. The silver lens is a bit heavier, but in real-world use I didn't really feel much of a difference, at least not to the point where I would start to miss the 100-400mm. The zoom and focus rings on both lenses have a rubber cover, which is pleasant to the touch. The zoom ring on the 150-600mm is a bit smoother and more precise overall, and both lenses offer a small rotation arc so you can quickly go from the shortest to the longest focal length. Then we have the aperture ring, which is clicking in one-third steps, and I find the one on the silver lens smoother to turn. One thing about the aperture ring is that you can accidentally change the f value without realizing it, and that is especially true for the silver lens. You can see this example right now with a picture of a seal taken at f16, and there was no good reason to have such a small aperture, also because you get diffraction and the image is less sharp. Thankfully, I noticed this a few frames later and corrected the aperture, but it happened a few times, so I decided to set the ring to auto and use the front dial of the camera instead. Next, we can talk about a few physical controls. The first is the focus limiter with full range of 5 m to infinity. It's the same on both lenses, but you can also customize this in camera on the most recent Fuji models. In the menu, you'll find the AF range limiter setting, and if you choose the custom option, you can build one from scratch with any distance that you want. You can also map this to a function button, but don't forget to leave the switch on the lens to full. Then we have something unique to the silver lens, which is the focus selector switch with three options, and this works with the set button as well as the four black focus control buttons you find near the front of the lens. If you set the switch to AFL, pressing any of the black buttons will lock focus. Move the switch to AF on, and the black buttons become an alternative to the back button focus on your camera. Press any of them, and the camera will engage the autofocus. If you move the switch to the middle option, which is called preset, you can save a specific focus distance with the set button that you can recall at any time. This can be useful, for example, if you know your subject will stay in the same area, you save the distance and you recall it if the camera misfocuses on the background or just struggles to acquire focus for whatever reason. Note that this function, this preset function, is only compatible with the cameras you're seeing on screen right now and also make sure to have the latest firmware installed. The 100-400mm has an optical stabilization switch, and I was surprised to not find the same on the silver lens as well. With the 150-600, you turn the stabilization on and off from the camera. Next, we have the tripod mount, and I really like the solution designed for the silver lens. To take it off, you simply loose the large knob here, and then you press the release lever to remove it. Invert the process to attach it. It's easy, quick, and very effective. This is how tripod color fit should be designed, and it is also directly compatible with Arca Swiss heads. The foot on the black lens can be removed with these two small knobs, but they are more annoying to turn, and you'll need to attach a separate plate for Arca Swiss tripods. Another nice thing about the 150-600mm is the two strap eyelets which allow you to attach your strap to the lens rather than the camera. 
Finally, we have the two lens hoods, and they are basically the same. They feel plasticky, but have a locking mechanism and a small sliding door to access a polarizing filter. The two lenses have a different range of focal length, with the 150-600mm giving you more reach at the telephoto end. Here you can see how this difference affects a real-life subject, first between 100 and 150mm, and then between 400 and 600mm. Neither lens have a constant aperture and you can see how it changes as you zoom towards the telephoto end. What I can highlight is that at 400mm, the silver lens opens at f7.1 versus f5.6 on the black lens, and that means the silver lens is two thirds of a stop darker at that focal length. It's not a huge difference by any means, but some of you might appreciate this extra detail. Of course, as you zoom in all the way to 600mm, the difference becomes one stop, but you also benefit from that 200mm extra reach. There isn't a lot to talk about in this section because these two lenses deliver very similar results and all the differences I found average between small and very small. The first takeaway concerning sharpness is that the 100-400mm to gives you good result wide open, but peak sharpness is generally one stop down from the fastest aperture, if not a bit more. For example, the best result is at f8 for 200 and 300mm. It also suffers a bit more from diffraction, at f16 and f22. The second takeaway is that the silver lens delivers optimal results at the fastest apertures already. This is valid on the entire zoom range, including 600mm. And it suffers a bit less from diffraction at f16, especially between 300mm and 600mm. So really there isn't a lot more to say when it comes to sharpness, so I'll leave you with some examples you can look at. I didn't include all of them so that you won't fall asleep, but if you want to check the results for every focal length and every aperture, go on my website, the link is in the description. Neither lens offers attractive fast apertures, and the quality of the autofocus background is certainly not the main selling point. In general, the bokeh looks similar. If we magnify the image, we can notice slightly brighter edges around the autofocus circles on the 100-400mm, but the black lens also keeps these circles more rounded at the edge. You need a strong source of light entering the lens directly to see reflections, 
If that happens, both lenses can produce ghost flares and those on the 100 to 400 are more invasive and vivid in colors. I didn't find traces of chromatic aberration nor relevant distortion. The latter is most likely corrected in camera, but the end result is flawless really. And there is a small amount of vignetting at the fastest apertures, but it's very easy to correct in post with minimal efforts. And to be honest, most of the time, I didn't do it simply because I didn't even notice it. This is another section of this review where there is little to discuss. Both lenses deliver fast performance with static subjects, as well as fast autofocus with moving animals such as red kites in flight. With my birds in flight test, I got a similar keeper rate with the two lenses using the X-H2S and the X-T4. Please note that a difference of a few points is irrelevant really. The X-T4 did well considering that by the time I started testing it with the 15600, the light became worse with heavy clouds hiding the sunshine. As always, you can find out more about my birds in flight test on my website, the link is in the description. The 100-400mm has a shorter minimum focus distance, but because of the more narrow field of view, the 150-600mm allows you to magnify the subject more. As for the manual focus experience, the focus ring on the silver lens is very light and freely to rotate, whereas that of the black lens is more stiff, and I find the latter to be more precise when working manually. Both lenses have a rating of 5 stops of compensation. The rating can go higher when paired with a camera that has in-body image stabilization. I took 10 shots at different focal lengths and shutter speeds with each lens to see how far I could push the performance with the X-H2S and see what kind of keeper rate they would deliver. Here are the results. From all this really, what is important to remember is that the 100 is capable of delivering sharp images between 1 4th of a second and 1 8th of a second, but the keeper rate is low. The performance improves significantly from 1 15th of a second at 100mm and 1 30th of a second at 400mm. The silver lens does a bit better at 150mm and it struggled more at 400mm than 600mm, which was a bit surprising. Here as well, you get better results from 1 15th of a second at 150mm and 1 30th of a second from 400mm. These results also show that speeds like 1 60th of a second or 1 125th of a second are perfectly usable, and they will help you keeping your ISO down in difficult light conditions, provided that your subject is not moving too much. With small birds, you can also shoot in burst mode to ensure you get a decent amount of sharp images. Fuji lenses don't have an option to give priority to the vertical or horizontal shake correction, like many competitor lenses, you know the classic 1-2-3 switch you find on Sony and Canon lenses for example, and that is also true for the 100-400 and the 150-600mm. Now, according to Fujifilm, the 100 can automatically detect the type of movement and adjust the correction accordingly. I couldn't find the same information for the silver lens, I hope it has the same capability. I didn't have any problems when leaving the optical stabilization active on these two lenses, but in the past I did find a few frames with motion blur when testing other Fuji lenses, like for example the 70-300mm. Now, most certainly, the 100 and the 150 have a more advanced optical stabilization, but sometimes I am still in doubt, so with fast-moving subjects and a safe shutter speed, I prefer to turn the stabilization off, just to be on the safe side. The two lenses are compatible with the 1.4x and the 2x teleconverters. Here is how the field of view and fastest aperture change.
Concerning the quality and sharpness, I have the same conclusion as the previous test. Here we have the 100-400mm at 400mm and f5.6, then with the 1.4 teleconverter at f8, and the 2 times teleconverter at f11. The quality is good, but if you close the aperture by one stop, sharpness increases. It's not a big difference once again, but it's there. With the 150-600mm, the best results are already available at the fastest aperture. The autofocus performance slows down a little when using the converters, especially the 2 times converter. You also have to consider that with the silver lens and the 2 times teleconverter at 600mm, you're working at f16 minimum, so you will need a good amount of light to get good results with anything that is moving. Let's have a quick look at the prices before heading for the conclusion. Brand new, the 100-400mm is less expensive, but not by much depending on the country. Second hand, you can find it for much less, which is interesting. The 150-600mm is more expensive and also brand new, so it's more difficult to find second hand prices. Comparing these two lenses turned out to be an easier task than I thought. On a general scale, they both perform very well when it comes to optical quality and autofocus. And to me, the primary benefit of the new 150-600mm is the zoom range. It is very versatile and very practical for wildlife photography. Also, if you consider that the lens is not too big, nor is too heavy, and it also offers extra controls like the focus preset switch and the four buttons around the barrel. The silver lens gives you the best results wide open so you don't need to stop down to get that extra sharpness, which is a good thing considering that it is not a fast zoom lens. In general, the 150-600mm delivers and there is hardly anything to criticize. The 100 has the advantage of a faster aperture, although if you are very picky about having the very best sharpness the lens has to offer, then you need to close the aperture by one stop. And seen from this angle, the aperture advantage becomes less important. Another thing to consider is the teleconverters. With the silver lens, I was less tempted to use them unless, of course, the subject was too far away. Often, I found 600mm to be enough and I was happy to crop a bit in post rather than stopping down the aperture. And with a camera like the X-H2 and its 40 megapixel sensor, perhaps this point becomes even more interesting. More reach with the 100-400mm means adding at least the 1.4 teleconverter, which once again erases the benefit of the faster aperture, also considering that you need to stop down for the best sharpness. The main advantage of the 100-400 is the price, if you find a good offer for the product brand new or in good condition second hand. Final note, and I want to talk about a third lens, which is the Tamron 150-500mm, because I know some of you will ask about this. I've tested the Sony version of this lens, so I can share a few things. The Tamron is a very good lens in my opinion. In my comparison, it proved to be at the same level as the Sony 200-600mm when it comes to sharpness and autofocus. There is a good amount of controls on the barrel, the lens is compact and not too heavy. Tamron has already announced the x man version and it has a more attractive price than the two Fujinon lenses I reviewed in this video. It also allows you to compensate movements in one direction only with the stabilization using the dedicated switch, which is something Fuji lenses don't have as we saw earlier on. I cannot recommend the Tamron with my eyes closed uh, without testing the x man version of course, but I cannot think of any reason why it wouldn't give the same performance on your Fuji camera as it did on my Sony camera. And at that price, I think it can become the best option for wildlife photographers because 150-500mm means 225-750mm to 750 millimeter equivalent field of view, which is really good. The only thing that could discourage some photographers is that the Tamron is not compatible with teleconverters, just like the Sony version. I don't know if I'll have the chance to test the Fuji version of this lens. Tamron lenses are more difficult to find, uh, to rent. The Fuji version might not be available for a while, but as always, I'll do my best. In the meantime, if you're interested, you can watch my test of the Sony version 
The link is in the description. And right, I think we reached the end of this video. I hope you found it useful. As always, don't hesitate to leave a comment, ask any question that you may have. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.